I want to talk about ethics in the context of GeoAI. Um, this won't be entirely about GeoAI because many of the ethical issues which arise in GeoAI also arise in broader uh, geospatial science. Um, so I'm going to be bridging that gap um, in various ways and repeatedly. Um, I want to start with a little bit of uh, my credentials. If I can, there we go. Um, <clears throat> I've been involved for several years now in a project called Geoethics. And it's a project that is sponsored by ESRI and the American Association of Geographers and UC Santa Barbara. And it has been pursuing ethical issues in, in the geospatial world. Um, there's a, a, a an organizing committee, which includes, I'm sure, many people who you'll be familiar with, um, but spanning the geospatial sciences, but also going out into sociology and into a broader context. And um, the first thing we notice in thinking about geoethics is what a vast area it is, how many different ethical issues there are. Uh, while many people would think immediately of privacy and confidentiality as ethical issues raised by geospatial technology and surveillance of the use of geospatial technology for surveillance, um, there are many, many others. And I want to focus more this morning on, on those uh, than the ones you might immediately think of. So a big question arises then how to prioritize the different issues and to do that, we assembled a um, group of people in Santa Barbara in 2022, uh, which we called the Geoethics Summit. We had uh, 30, 35 people and uh, a very uh, extensive discussion on four subtopics. So number one, a research agenda, because um, do we need research to address some of these ethical issues? are the things we don't yet know how to do. And then education and training, how do we raise people's awareness of ethical issues? And then very active area of federal and state regulation. Uh, in many ways, other parts of the world, particularly Europe, are well ahead of the US in um, regulating geospatial technology, regulating GeoAI, and from an ethical perspective. And then, Finally, uh, attempting to bring a broader base into the discussion, um, particularly non-traditional and indigenous users of geospatial uh, technology and GeoAI. So there is a report, it came out of the, the meeting. Um, I warn you, it's 23,000 plus words. Um, there is a quick start guide online uh, which will help you if you're interested in introducing some of these issues into courses. And one of the points that is made very strongly in that report is that ethics should not be left to the last lecture in the, in the uh, course or the last chapter in a book, um, but it should be part of everything that we think of. And I hope I'll, I'll make that point clear as I go through this. Um, the report acknowledges that GI science students, uh, GAI students, um, tend to become well aware of the technical issues of, of making maps and analyzing geospatial data, but they lack grounding in the ethical implications that are inherent in those decisions. And there are many, many places in which those uh, ethical issues arise, including something as simple as cartographic design, how to present data in map form is fraught with all sorts of ethical issues. So uh, to talk specifically about machine learning and GeoAI, um, there are of course numerous ethical issues which have been raised um, in the popular media, uh, but I want to focus on a few of them. Um, so reproducibility and replicability, two principles which are core to the scientific method. Um, what is discovered using experimentation should be reproducible in the sense that there should be enough detail reported 
to allow someone else to repeat the experiment. Uh, but replicability is rather broader, and replicability means that uh, the results should be replicable using different software, uh, perhaps using a different sample, uh, and that is a much more complicated issue. And as soon as we apply these principles to machine learning, uh, we realize that inevitably machine learning is to some extent a black box, and so reproducibility becomes problematic. Um, there are, of course, forms of machine learning which don't always produce the same answers every time they're used. And that in itself is, is running up against the principle of reproducibility. And then there's the whole question of explainable AI and whether we will ever be able to reach the point where AI is a completely open uh, and transparent technology rather than to some extent a black box. So if we put that specifically in the context of geospatial technology, where replicability is often talked about as generalizability, can I take what I discover in one area and apply it elsewhere? Or transferability is the typical term in, in machine learning. Um, both of those run up against the very basic principle of geospatial data of spatial heterogeneity. The world is not homogenous. Parts of the world are different, and necessarily what is discovered about New York City won't necessarily apply to London or Paris. Um, there is an article of mine which goes into this in, in much greater detail. It's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's a 2021 paper with Wenwen Li of Arizona State University. And it argues that replication across space and time must be weak in the social and environmental sciences. In other words, it will always be difficult to transfer what is learned from one part of the world to another part of the world, and the same in time uh, to replicate or generalize. So very fundamental issues of an ethical nature arise when we try to use um, machine learning techniques uh, applied to geospatial data. Um, perhaps the best known of these is sampling bias um, and the whole question of, in machine learning of what is being learned from. So what is the sample? How representative is it? Uh, we've seen that in numerous instances with facial recognition. But then also we would have to add geographic representation. What part of the world is being learned from? and temporal representation, what time is being learned from. And all of these are ethical issues which arise whenever machine learning is applied to geospatial data. Um, I want to talk in terms of the Turing test, which of course is named for Alan Turing. And um, this is the principle that, uh, the question as to whether the results of GeoAI are indistinguishable from the work of a human. And this, I think, is a very important test of what we're beginning to call digital twins. So is a digital twin subject to, does it pass the Turing test? Does the digital twin, uh, what we learn from a digital twin should be uh, also true of the, the real physical world, but is it in fact? And I thought I'd just show a couple of illustrations here. Um, this is an Esri illustration of making the point that GIS is a foundation for digital twins. Um, this happens to be part of Denver, Colorado. And the Turing test asks whether that is actually a photograph. Is it how the world, real world looks? Or is it a simulation from a digital twin? And I think it's fairly easy to, to um, show that this is, in fact, not passing the digital twin. It may pass a digital twin specifically for the built form of the city. But what it misses will always be the human aspects. So the, you can see some traffic on the street, but that is not a simulation of traffic. That is an actual photograph of traffic. And similarly, the, uh, the patchiness of the lawn uh, is not a simulation, it's, it's a real picture. So we're clearly gonna have trouble, and this will always be true, that uh, in any application of digital twins using geospatial data, 
it will always be <clears throat> true that the humans, the population, the uh, physical congestion of the city is not capable of passing the Turing test, whereas the physical built form may well be. So in that sense, digital twins for cities have really gravitated towards a very effective and compelling simulation, but only of the built form, not of how the city actually operates. Um, so in other words, empty streets are uh, symptomatic of efforts to create digital twins of cities. So here's a, a much older photograph, the, the image, this uh, one I've had for about 25 years. It came from Jakarta, and it seems to be a simulation of uh, a part of Jakarta, until you notice that every person is identical. There are only four types of vehicles shown on the streets, and the facades of the buildings have been copied from one building to another. So this is, of course, very, very far short of a true digital twin of, uh, of Jakarta. I want to talk specifically about the responsibility of the user in, ethic, in ethical issues. And um, in part, this is driven by a concern that I've had for a very long time. And a lot of the research that I've done has been on uncertainty in geospatial data. And uncertainty is surely endemic in geospatial data. There's no such thing as perfect geospatial data. And yet we consistently, I think, ignore uncertainty. And that to me comes down to an ethical issue. If the user ignores, knows about uncertainty, but ignores it, that surely is, is an ethical violation. And yet in the way that we've built the software, and this is true of GIS, and it's also true of GeoAI and machine learning, we've left it to the user to be responsible for ethics. And um, this is what you might call, if you, if you like Latin phrases, caveat emptor, which is simply translated to buyer beware. Uh, we create software which is purpose agnostic, designed to be useful in any application. And we leave it to the user to be responsible for the ethical issues. And I've used uncertainty here as, as an example, but there are many, many other issues. And let me give you some examples because I think there are two possible responses to this issue. One is education. One, of course, is going out and making sure that, that our students are well aware of the ethical issues of GeoAI. Um, but at the same time, we might see this as a responsibility of the software. And I want to explore that a little bit because I think this is something that OGC might well uh, be interested in. So this is saying that ethics are not so much the responsibility of the user as the responsibility of the software developer. How can we modify software so that it is more ethically sensitive? So how might this work? And let me give you a, a couple of examples. So these are ethical issues that the average user uh, might well not recognize, not be aware of, and the experienced user might possibly have forgotten. Um, so these are issues, the ethical issues that arise, and that the software currently it does nothing about. So the suggestion I'm making is that the software might generate messages to the user when an unethical inference or an unethical action appears likely. These messages would have to be easily turned off. Uh, you don't want to see the same messages more than once. Uh, but these messages could include references to further material, to further explanation. And let me just give you a, a few examples. Um, just to, to think back in terms of uncertainty, we have shown, research has shown, that all the obvious ways of displaying uncertainty in a map don't work. Uh, blurring, grain, buffering will all likely be misinterpreted because people expect maps to be perfect. And yet, of course, we know they never are. <clears throat> so here's an example. This is a, um, uh, a, a plot of, uh, on the x-axis, <clears throat> the uh, percent of the population of a county that is black, 
This is the state of Mississippi by county in 1990. And the y-axis is the median value of house. And I've shown there a um, ordinary squares line, but it might well be a machine learning uh, result. So what it shows is that the, uh, the higher the percent black in the county, the lower the median value of housing. Right. And the danger here is what is known as the ecological fallacy. So the ecological fallacy is to interpret that result as indicating that blacks are more likely to live in cheaper houses. What that does then is reason from the county level down to the individual level. And that does not follow. Right? It doesn't follow from this analysis that black families are any more likely to live in cheaper houses. Instead, what it merely shows is that counties with lots of black families also have lots of cheaper houses on average. And if you translate this to, uh, to COVID, there are many, many published examples of where this ecological fallacy has been made in analyzing the rate of COVID infection in let's say census tracts or counties or states across the US. It was common at that time to make the inference that it was the individuals uh, who were getting COVID and not the aggregate. So a couple of other examples, the Openshaw effect, which many people, uh, which are probably are more likely to call the modifiable aerial unit problem. Um, let's assume that there is some analysis being done based on watersheds or zip codes or census tracts. And what the open shore effect says is that the results of the analysis will change when the boundaries are changed. An analysis by watershed will not produce the same answers as an analysis by zip code. And anyone doing this kind of analysis needs to be aware of this. And my point is simply that the software can make the user aware by simple pop-up messages and references to, to some of the, the underlying research. So just one last example. Um, this is, we're in Santa Barbara County. Uh, we're uh, looking at two data sets. The um, polygons are uh, vegetation cover class and the shading is elevation based on a 30 meter DEM. And I've taken one particular polygon, which is labeled in this database as white fir, and I've computed the average elevation in that polygon, which is uh, 7920.9 feet. Now, the question, the issue here is that these boundaries, the thin lines shown on this map don't exist in reality. They're not replicable. Two experts asked to make the same map would not agree. And they might represent approximately uh, an ecotone, an, a zone of, of change from dominant white fur to non-dominant. But the point is they are not replicable in a scientific sense. And yet my software has told me the area of that polygon to the nearest square meter. And it's told me the perimeter length of that polygon to six decimal places of meters. Right. Now, you know, and I know, and most users know that those numbers need to be taken with a great deal of salt uh, because we know that those boundaries don't really exist. But how do we get that message across? And what I'm suggesting is that it's the software that could do that. So what do we need to be aware of here? We need to be aware of the, of the temptation to give excessive precision to vector data. Maps of vegetation cover are not replicable. The boundaries do not exist in reality. So compare that to this example, which is part of Austin, Texas. The red lines are school district boundaries and the black lines are census blocks. And the two, of course, have been overlaid. A spatial join has been made. And the green areas are areas where a census block is cut by a, a school district boundary. This is a very different situation. But to the software, it looks the same. To the software, the perimeters could be computed to the nearest um, 
six decimal places or meters, and uh, the areas could be computed in the nearest square meter. And we'd be happy to doing that because we know that these boundaries are very different. These are replicable. These are legal boundaries rather than the uh, very different boundaries of the first example. So what do these two examples have in common? They each require a certain amount of knowledge of the data that could be captured in metadata, but probably isn't. And they, we know that there's a world of difference between non-replicable mapping of vegetation cover and precise mapping of political or administrative boundaries. And yet, of course, in our software, we treat the two as the same. So here's, uh, in both of these cases, the software could remind the user of ethical issues. So what I'm arguing for is a new generation of ethical software going beyond the buyer beware, greater attention to metadata, and awareness of the ethical issues on the part of the software designers. In other words, co-design of software with critical spatial thinkers. Now, the final point, and this one may be the one that you want to think about the most, is the marketing implications of this. Because we have created a software uh, with a buyer beware philosophy behind it. But that's something that uh, if, if we were to create a, an ethical software, uh, I think we would have to consider the, the very different approach we would have to, take, have to take to marketing it. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been interesting. I hope I've left a couple of minutes for, for any questions. And uh, again, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Michael Guchal. Are there any questions? Yeah, this is, I don't know if you can hear me way out here. This is Jim Anthony calling in from uh, south of you. Can you hear me? Just, yeah, it's going to be difficult, but I hope so. Okay. Uh, this is a very general problem, as you mentioned, uh, not just geo, but it, it cross, cuts across all of AI. Uh, are there specifically geo uh, work that you could point to, for instance, in uh, explainable uh, AI or anything like that? Um, I, th I think we're, of course, very, um, very concerned about making machine learning explainable. Um, I think, though, um, uh, my sense of what has been achieved so far is that it's only been achieved by slight changes in what we mean by explainable. Mm -hmm. If we go back to um, pure science, and science is concerned with explanation, discovery, understanding, those are probably beyond the capabilities of the work that's been done so far in explainable AI. Um, and I'm not terribly hopeful that that will change. I think we have a great deal of difficulty in um, matching the methods and approaches of, of uh, machine learning to the uh, original concepts of science. And one way out of that, of course, is to change our perception of science and to say we weren't terribly concerned, perhaps, about replicability. Um, it's still interesting. And, and this is certainly true that um, uh, machine learning applied to prediction is enormously successful. And yet, of course, prediction was never a primary goal of science. Um, we, however, in, in many areas of science, such as weather forecasting, where prediction is, is what we're really about, um, we are certainly at the point where machine learning now has very considerable advantages over traditional methods of weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we, we need to go field by field. Um, and I would pick similar examples out of the geospatial world and say that machine learning applied to agriculture, for example, uh, which is 
much more about prediction, about access to information, uh, much less about discovery, explanation, understanding. Uh, I think we are in excellent shape there. But if you think about the broader uh, domain of science, and you think particularly about um, social aspects, human health, um, human behavior, it's, it's here that we really run into, I think, a great deal of trouble. So it's, it's a very uh, convoluted and mixed story. Um, and I think um, we're at a very interesting point in science uh, where many of the original uh, objectives of science are being questioned or bypassed uh, in order to achieve things which are undoubtedly important to, to human society. Okay, thank you. So there's also a question from the audience. Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Dr. Goodchild. I'm just picking up again on this topic of uh, uncertainty and the yeah. ethics of showing uncertainty. I work in the field of hydrography, ocean mapping, yes. and of course in this field we've got to identify shoals that could potentially, you know, a ship could get caught upon or, or crash. Right. So one of the one of the methodologies, of course, is to propagate uncertainty. Uh, use error ellipses to decide here's the rock or here's the vicinity that a rock could be in so that right. we can create an area of uh, you know an area not to go in because it's obviously of a hazard so I think right. I think my point is there is some uses of where uncertainty is being tried to be modeled that can, yes. can help and I just wondered if you had a comment on that yeah I think um, in in instances like the one you cite of where is the rock um, I think we're in good shape, and we have lots of lots of techniques. What's much more complicated, I think, much more problematic, is in predicting, for example, the impact of sea level rise on a city like Boston. Uh, we have a, a pretty good digital elevation data on Boston, but it still has uh, uncertainties. Uh, in elevation, uh, even the best data has uncertainties at the at the meter level. And uh, in terms of predicting the future coastline, uh, that gives us a great deal of trouble. Underlying all of this is the fact that um, geospatial data is full of spatial dependence. And so any simulation of something as complicated as, as sea level rise is going to have to take that into account. Um, so yes, some 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 very good examples, but in general, a tremendous problem. I think the um, in some ways the biggest problem is how is lies in how people interpret maps. Um, the I've done work on the um, methods that NOAA and other agencies use to display the future tracks of hurricanes. And you know, we've all seen these expanding cones, um, which are based on the existing location and past locations of the eye of the hurricane, and then try to predict its future locations. And um, in the work that we've done, uh, using students typically as the human subjects, and even students who have a background in atmospheric science, um, it turns out that the vast majority of, of people interpret those things as indicating the hurricane is going to get bigger, not that its future location is uncertain. So we have a tremendous problem to, to um, tackle the unreasonable expectations we have about maps. Thank you. Uh, are there any, any more questions? Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Goodchild. Um, I just have a, I, I was wondering when you were talking about GUAI, um, if you think that probably we're forgetting the stochasticity in our models, like, you know, um, yeah. do you think that by including this stochasticity, we will allow to some uh, uncertainty to be understood better? Uh, 
instead of uh, boiling it. Um, yeah. So I, I come more from a bottom-up approaches like CA or ABM. Uh, but I still don't see it make it part of the GUI. So I just really wanted to hear uh, your comments. Yeah. Um, yes, we can. We can do that. Um, yes, we can uh, produce a range of possible answers. Um, the really gets sticky when you run that into the process of decision making, um, because decision makers will always prefer a single answer. And um, if we present them with a range of answers, there's always the danger that they will select that answer from the range which best suits them uh, and we, we we all do this and we get uh, opinion polls on the presidential election which say that the vote for a is such and such plus or minus two percent and we add or subtract that two percent depending on our own personal um biases and desires so it's um uh Yes, there are wonderful things we can do, um, but the decision-making process is really the, the where these things run aground and uh, give us the greatest difficulty. Okay, so uh, there's one more, yeah. Yeah, maybe one additional question, is he still there? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's Gordon Plunkett from Esri Canada. Um, hi, Gordon. Hi. Um, the, uh, uh, professional engineer in the province of Ontario and I was at a meeting about a month ago and there was a, a discussion about ethical software and they were saying or what they're implicating is that if um, like engineers have been signing off bridges and buildings and that that they're safe uh, but they're getting into this issue of self-driving cars I mean they've been signing off airplanes and all this kind of thing but they're saying that the software and the systems in those vehicles should be signed off by a licensed practitioner. I'm just wondering, yes. in some cases, you don't need that uh, level of uh, certification, but in some cases you do, and I'm just wondering if you have any ideas where they should draw the line. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a huge problem because the variety of disasters that can occur with an autonomous vehicle is so wide. And, um, it's interesting that we, um, as a society, certainly in the U.S., um, tolerate a certain level of accidents on highways. Um, it's, it's consistently about 40,000 deaths a year. And yet um, we uh, get very, um, our attention is grabbed by single issues of um, an autonomous vehicle causing an accident. It's, um, it's a very different, fickle public to deal with. One that on the one hand tolerates, uh, appears to tolerate 40,000 accidents a year. And on the other hand, um, pays enormous attention when an exploding airbag um, injures somebody. So we're, we're, we can't really come to grips with those numbers, I think. And so it seems to me very problematic to expect any any professional, um, however licensed, to attest to the safety of, of an autonomous vehicle. Um, the news coming out of China is very interesting because um, it's clear that the government is um, uh, wholeheartedly in favor of, of autonomous vehicles in a way that that our governments in the US and Canada typically are not. Um, so yeah, I think that, that that would be a very interesting discussion to have. Um, but I would say that the range of possibilities is so enormous that um, any kind of certification against all of the possibilities is gonna be very difficult. 